Good afternoon. My name is Captain Amanda Williams. I am an active duty uh, Army judge advocate, and so I'm going to moderate the panel for today. Um, and I'm going to have, just at the very beginning, I'm going to have our panelists go through and kind of tell you a little bit about the position they're in right now, um, so you have an idea of kind of the experience on the panel. Um, our goal today is to educate civilian attorneys with little experience in the military justice system on lessons learned by the military that could be applied outside of the military context. Um, we've got a number of topics that fall in this broad category and a good deal of experience in the panel. Um, so please ask questions. Uh, please ask us to explain things that aren't clear because we won't know that you don't understand them unless you ask. Um, and uh, because they are taping it, they'd request that you ask from the microphone just so that that can be recorded as well. Um, with that started, uh, I'm going to have Captain Kelly introduce himself first and then just kind of go down the, the panel. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Captain Brian Kelly. I'm a Special Victims Counsel. Uh, which is what the Army calls uh, an attorney who solely represents the victim of a sexual offense. Um, stationed at Fort Bliss, currently doing that role. Uh, prior to that, I was a trial counsel and a defense counsel, so I've seen uh, military justice on both sides of the V. Um, trial counsel is our prosecutors. Correct. I'm going to rely on Amanda to uh, <coughs> translate when necessary. Um, and uh, this has been an incredibly rewarding experience, the job that I'm doing now, um, bringing some of the skills and lessons that I've learned uh, in those other roles and uh, using it to uh, the victim's uh, advantage to make sure that they uh, get a say in the process and uh, walk away feeling like their voice was heard. Hi, I'm Eric Carpenter. I'm a retired Army judge advocate. I teach now at the FIU College of Law, which is Miami's public law school. Uh, I still am involved in military justice stuff, and my research right now is uh, really about measuring if any of this stuff works. My name is Krista Specht, and I am the Coast Guard's chief of the uh, Member Advocacy Division, which means I have responsibility over Special Victims Council, so just like the captain said, and then responsibility over our disability evaluation systems, which basically means if someone gets injured while they're in the Coast Guard and they can no longer do their work, they're going to be fired, and so they have a due process here, and so I'm responsible for that function as well. Prior to that, I worked for the Department of Education in the Office for Civil Rights, so I was doing Title IX sexual assault on college campuses, and before that, I was active duty Air Force Jack. I was wondering if we would have someone from the Air Force, some representation here, so. <laughs> I asked someone, someone. Yeah, I did ask them. <laughs> <laughs> Felt a little bad leaving them out. Um, my name is Lieutenant Colonel Adam Kazin. Uh, my current job, I'm trying to think of my, my actual title here, I'm the branch chief for the policy division of the criminal law division of the Office of the Judge Advocate General in the Pentagon. And what all of that means is when you're a lieutenant colonel in the Pentagon, you're going to get a lot of general's coffee. Um, but actually my job right now is mostly handling policy, um, implementing policy from Congress and recommending changes to legislation and regulations um, concerning criminal justice in the military. Uh, I started actually my career as a special assistant United States attorney for two years, so all my initial prosecution was in federal, uh, federal court, both at the misdemeanor and felony level. I prosecuted as a trial counsel or military prosecutor for a year in Korea uh, before doing a five-year stint as an appellate attorney uh, here in D.C. before the Army Court of Criminal Appeals and the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. Um, after that, I got promoted to major, which means they didn't want me <laughs> litigating cases anymore. And uh, I was a brigade judge advocate, which is a legal advisor to a brigade, uh, army brigade. Uh, regional defense council, where I supervised uh, 20 defense attorneys from across the southeast United States. Um, and then after that, I was deputy uh, staff judge advocate in Kuwait for a year. So. Wow, he's got a lot more experience than I do. <laughs> um, my name is Lieutenant Commander Jen Luce, and I basically have the, my current position is the same as Lieutenant Colonel Kazin. We actually work together, but on the Navy side of the house. So uh, military justice policy, um, where we actually, well, I guess all three of us on occasion serve on the Joint Service Committee, um, or on the, the Navy has the chair of the Joint Service Committee for, uh, for two more months. We're going to give it over to the Army. Um, it's a committee on military justice and criminal law in the in the military. Um, I'm so I'm the executive executive secretary in that committee right now. Uh, prior to that, so I guess my first tour was I was a defense attorney for a couple of years. So I went to Afghanistan, worked in an Afghanistan courtroom for about seven eight months, and then was a prosecutor or trial counsel. Uh, in the Northwest for three years, and then a defense counsel for three years after that down in San Diego. And I've been here for only 
a few months adjusting to the cold weather here and the various different uh, weather systems that don't exist in San Diego. Uh, so that's my experience. Good afternoon. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Ian Fadden. I'm the branch head of military justice for the Marine Corps. I'm basically the deputy chief prosecutor. It's also a military justice policy position. Uh, prior to entering active duty several years ago, I worked in the office of the Illinois Attorney General uh, doing uh, death penalty appellate litigation. I was in that office at the time that then Governor Ryan declared blanket clemency uh, for all the prisoners on death row. Uh, two of those were my cases. Uh, entered active duty in 2003. I was a defense counsel, a senior defense counsel. I've been a prosecutor, had several uh, command legal advisor positions where I acted as a staff judge advocate or kind of in-house counsel for a commander. I uh, spent three years teaching at the Army's uh, JAG school uh, in the criminal law department. I taught evidence and uh, constitutional law and then came to the Pentagon uh, last summer. Um, I have not served as some of the other folks on the panel here uh, as a victim's counsel, but we do send officers to those courses and so I've gone and been certified as a special victims counsel, a victims legal counsel, and I'm a certified and sworn military judge. All right, so to demonstrate how well we work together with the different services, I'm not going to even ask you, so certain people to ask a question, just to answer the question if you think you're the right person for it. Um, would one of you please give a very brief overview of the military justice system and how an alleged offense ends up at a court martial? Seems like the judge. Right? Everybody goes all at once. <laughs> It's, it's very similar and, and probably an important uh, idea to remember at the outset is there's actually a statute that says that military courts should, uh, to the maximum extent practicable, be very similar to practice in federal district courts. And so uh, they're not concepts with which you'd be unfamiliar. Uh, the main difference is that the commander ultimately is the one that makes the balance of decisions in the military justice system. So there's an offense. Uh, ordinarily, a law enforcement agency investigates that offense. They'll present a report of that investigation to a commander who makes a determination as to whether or not charges will be preferred. Preferral is a term of art. Um, and so instead of, for example, a grand jury proceeding, uh, you would have a preferral of charges, uh, and depending on the disposition of them, whether they're tried by special or general court martial, there might be another hearing to determine the weight and quality of that evidence before the charges are ultimately referred to one or more uh, different dispositions. And so a common one would be a special court martial. Uh, easy to think of that as a misdemeanor court. The maximum punishment in confinement terms is 12 months. A general court martial is more for more serious offenses. Uh, and the maximum punishment for offenses there is whatever the punishment is announced for that portion of the code. And so obviously murder cases and things like that, the punishment's much more severe. Typically, you'll see more serious offenses tried by general court martial, less serious offenses tried by special court martial. Uh, there's also another uh, avenue of discipline in the military and all the services do it slightly differently. Uh, we have a variety of administrative punishments that are rooted in criminal law but disposed of based on the inherent authority of the commander and statutory authority in some cases. Uh, and that's where they can you know, take you in front of the captain on the ship, uh, they can tear off a stripe and take some of your pay and, and award as they use that term. Uh, award you other punishments. It doesn't sound like much of an award to me, uh, but there it is in the code nonetheless. Um, so it's a process that closely mirrors its civilian counterpart. Uh, and open to any other additions from other members of the panel. Do you want to address the appellate system? I guess I'll jump on that one. Five years. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the appellate system for the uh, military is done under uh, Congress's Article One authority, so they're not Article Three courts. Um, but they're very similar looking and they act very similar. So each service um, has, uh, although the Navy and Air, uh, Marine Corps share one, has a appellate court. Think of them as the circuit courts. And they hear criminal matters only, so they're not courts of general jurisdiction. Their job is to review certain levels of courts martial conviction. Um, it typically requires uh, a sentence of a, of a punitive discharge, dismissal, uh, DD, dishonorable discharge, or bad conduct discharge, or a certain level of confinement. So they hear those criminal cases, and those are made up of Army JAGs just like us. Any one of us could be a appellate court judge. They're appointed by the Judge Advocate General. Uh, there's, no con there's no congressional, um, there's no Senate review or anything like that. And they sit in uh, panels, and they hear cases, and they, either, they have the authority under Article 66 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice to review for both legal sufficiency but also factual sufficiency, which is very unique amongst appellate courts. They actually have the ability to sit and, and act as the 13th juror 
in these cases. So the Army Court of Criminal Appeals, if they review a case and they say, you know, I, I don't think the government proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt, even though I think, even though they proved it at the trial level, they can throw out all the charges. Um, it's been described as the 600-pound gorilla of their authority. So it's, it's something that um, is a unique protection that was instituted um, out of concerns that, uh, that these cases needed uh, another level of review. So all of those um, services have one of those courts, and there's a government appellate division, and there's a defense appellate division, and, and it's about basically moot court. You write briefs, and you, uh, and you argue in front of the judges, and they come down. I always said moot court is the closest thing to actual practice that I ever did in law school. Um, and then above them, above all the services, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. And what the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces represents is the civilian oversight of the military justice system. Just as um, our military is subject to civilian control, it's a, it's a central tenet of our, of our society that the military is subject to civilian control, our military justice system is subject to civilian control. It's five judges um, appointed from civilian life is the word in the statute, and it used to be that if you were retired from active duty service, you couldn't be on CAF, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. That changed just in the last couple of years. Now if you retired after a certain number of years, you can serve on CAF, but the idea is that you're still a civilian. Um, they are appointed for 15-year terms by the President, and they are subject to Senate review and confirmation by, by the Senate. So it kind of creates, again, a, a layer of something that looks like the civilian system. Um, it's, it's under different authorities, but it allows for that civilian oversight of the military justice system. The court of, their court is just downtown here. I've argued in front of it about 15 times, um, and that's, that's the basic system. If anyone's got any questions or... And then from there, it's actually appealable to the yeah. United States Supreme Court. Um, yes. So if you sit in a, a government or defense position, you can uh, file cert petitions to the Supreme Court after you've been gone to CAF. So an, an interesting limitation on that is it's only reviewable by the Supreme Court if it was reviewed by CAF. So if CAF says we don't want it, CAF is a, is a for, except for death penalty cases, CAF is a court <coughs> that can decide, pick and choose their cases. If CAF says we're not even going to review that case, it can't then jump up to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court can only review cases that are reviewed by CAF. And can I add two mm -hmm. cents in? Um, so you mentioned both the government and defense appellate mm -hmm. services. The victims have substantive rights, and they have the ability to appeal to those um, interim appellate authorities as well. And there's been probably, I mean, we're probably the most, I don't know this to be true necessarily, <laughs> but I feel like the military is pretty active in sort of sussing out what those rights look like because they do have attorneys that represent victims' rights. So what victims' appellate rights look like is still sort of a burgeoning area, um, and it's going to change potentially again with the NDAA 19, which is going to allow petitions to the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, which is that superior appellate court. Every service um, implements victims' appellate rights a little bit differently. I know the Army, it's the government appellate that actually files the brief. Is that right? Nope. Oh, okay, never no, mind then. They, they Everybody's it. doing it a little have bit you, differently. Have you done a writ yet? Uh, no, sir, but okay. uh, I'm familiar with the process. Okay. And uh, there are two avenues. You know, One could be an Article 60 appeal that the government could bring, but you could also do a, a writ for extraordinary relief. Um, you know, based and you have standing to do that as a special victims counsel to the service court of appeals. We're still kind of, and it was that was a new thing, and the courts were very confused by it first because for 50 years the only people that were before them were prosecution and defense, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it's like, well, do we need a third table in here? Do how do we how do we start working it in? So it's it's definitely been a growing mm -hmm. and learning process for those that have been in the military justice system under under one view for so long to start working in other people. Yeah, we had a, an appeal go to the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces and they actually set up the three tables. So it was mm -hmm. Victims' Council, Government Council, and Defense Council arguing. Mm -hmm. I think that's ref sorry. I'm sorry, go, go ahead. Sir. No. Uh, I was just going <coughs> to say, I think that's reflective of really a, a very organic change in the military justice system. And this would be an organic change in that civilian system too, right? We traditionally have this very uh, symbolically two-dimensional view of litigation where it's the scales of justice, right? I pile rocks on this side and rocks on that side, and whoever hits <coughs> the ground first wins. Um, it's really not the case anymore in the military justice system, which has taken on a much more three-dimensional aspect um, because although victims are not parties per se, uh, they have statutorily enumerated rights uh, and enforcement mechanisms by which they can litigate those <coughs> rights with the benefit of counsel, uh, as was pointed out uh, during the awards luncheon today. 
a counsel that's appointed and has a sole duty to that client. And although employed by the government, the duty runs to that individual client. Um, these procedural rights that we were talking about in appellate litigation used to sound uh, sort of ambiguously, maybe under the All Writs Act or from other places, uh, but now Article 6B, and, and Colonel Kazan mentioned uh, another article earlier, uh, anytime you hear a military justice practitioner say article, come to France, fill in the blank, uh, <laughs> put in front of that Title 10 United States Code section and then add 800 to whatever the number was. That's, that's <laughs> how you decode the mystical here, right? So Article 6B rights are uh, Title 10 USC uh, 806B. Uh, and it's this list of victims' rights that they can now litigate uh, in court at the trial level. Uh, they can bring writs directly to the Court of Criminal Appeals, and they'll soon have the statutory basis to do so in the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. And that's, that's kind of a big deal. Professor Carpenter has written on the role of the commander in the military justice system, um, and that's something that I know people hear uh, back and forth a little bit about. So I wonder if you can explain a little bit about the role of the commander. Sure. So this is actually the probably the last big component of the military justice uh, system that's unique and is still standing, and it's the uh, subject of the most uh, kind of direct reform efforts. <coughs> and right now we're in sort of advance, right? So we have the Military Justice Act in 2016, uh, and the critics are backing off uh, slightly. Uh, but it's, this is the area that's probably the last area uh, left standing. And once this part, if it does change, uh, the system, I think, will pretty much have uh, gone away. So we heard just kind of quickly that the community authorities uh, play the role of what a essentially what a county attorney or a county prosecutor would do uh, in a you know the county of a state, which is they ultimately make the decisions on whether to refer a case to, to trial or not. Uh, they don't do that in a vacuum. They've got a staff judge advocate who's uh, pretty senior as a licensed attorney, and almost always they do they take the advice of that staff judge advocate, but they don't have to. Uh, now, historically, the kind of interesting thing is uh, the system was criticized primarily because we, the public thought that uh, commanders couldn't run the system because they would over-prosecute, right? That they would just run this huge machine over privates and whatever you, I can't figure out the Navy ranks to save my life, <laughs> but uh, airmen, like, you know, junior people. Boats weighing third class. You know, <laughs> like and we're just running flat. Sailor works. Sailor works. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but what's happened over the last uh, about 20 years, really after Taylor, and that's even longer, it's 91 or something, but maybe closing on 30 years, is a criticism that they're not doing enough, right? So that there are certain classes of offenders that they are under prosecuting. One is uh, sexual assault offenders, uh, and the other one, which gets less attention uh, but has gotten some attention, are service members who are downrange and commit crimes against the local population or might otherwise do something that looks like a war crime. So that uh, those two areas are uh, under uh, prosecuted. Uh, and with various reform efforts over the last decade that have failed, that's really where they've been going uh, after that. So one part of the convening authority that tends to be a target of, or the convening authority's power that tends to be a target of uh, criticism is that prosecutorial discretion role. And then the other one is, uh, which looks really bizarre to people in the civilian world is they choose the panels. Right, so imagine if your county attorney decided to send a case to trial, and then it was also like, and I want this person who works for me, and this person who works for me, and this person who works for me to sit on the jury. Uh, and that still exists in the system. That hasn't been under nearly as much uh, scrutiny as the, the prosecutorial discretion part, but it's been a concern of the public for uh, a pretty long time. I think it turns out that I mean, there's a phrase used that those panels are called blue ribbon panels. Um, if I were going to go to trial, I would much rather, if I were on the receiving end of a justice system, I would much rather go in front of that panel because they are they're well educated and know how to solve problems. Uh, well, maybe if I was guilty, I wouldn't. Right? Maybe I wouldn't necessarily want to go in front of it because they're going to figure it out. Right? They're going to uh, get to the right answer. Um, but those are the two main areas that the public tends to have concern with our with the current system. It, one of the interesting things, the criticisms of the of the commanders, the convening authority's role in the decision to send a case forward is the idea that he's not legally trained. Um, so some guy, he's a general officer typically, a two-star general, uh, commands a division or something higher, 
makes life and death decisions about when you know when they go to war and which of his soldiers might live and which of his soldiers might die. But he's not legally trained, and the idea that somehow a non-legally trained person is making this decision. Um, and there's really kind of two points to that. One is they're never making the decision alone. They have to have the advice of a lawyer in the process. But the other thing that always struck me about that, and this comes from my experience of having my first two years as a as a SALSA, as a civilian um, <coughs> prosecutor, was that whenever I wanted to indict a case, um, I had to go before a grand jury of 24 non-legally trained people who maybe got a briefing beforehand or some sort of class beforehand, and I had to sing for my supper. It wasn't a very difficult process of, of getting an indictment, but yeah, I had to present my case to these 24 non-legally trained people, and if 12 of them said my case was good enough, it got to go forward. So I always look at the commander in a similar role as that representative of the community, a non-lawyer, because I think leaving the system to lawyers alone is a, is a terrible idea. We need non-lawyers to be part of the process, and it's a, it's a cooperative effort of I have to say something or make something work to get that case to go forward. I just can't do it on my own discretion. I have to get a normal person, um, and I use that normal person as a non-lawyer, to say that there's enough merit to my case to go forward. So, I, so there is some parallels with the idea of having non-legally trained people in the process. And I think it's important, I think it's consistent with the overall American system of justice um, to have that person in that, that process. If I can chime in a little bit in terms of how the civilian community can learn from uh, the military community. Uh, so when I was at the, I taught at the Army's Law School for three years, and one of my jobs was to do essentially death side briefs with uh, people who are about to take command of a general court martial uh, committee, a unit that had general court martial uh, committee authority. Uh, and I would sit down with them uh, and talk them through, you know, what are rape myths, uh, how can you identify what a rape myth is, how should you be processing cases, uh, what are some of the problems associated with these things. Uh, and most of them, by the time I had already, they had already come into my office, or I gone into the, the briefing room, knew, already knew a lot of that stuff. So they, based, just based on growing up in the, in the system and having been through a lot of training, they'd essentially already been what, it, what we could call de-biased, right? So they, they could process cases uh, in ways that I was comfortable with the way they were processing <coughs> cases. I'm not comfortable that all county attorneys about that, right? In the, the case we, maybe this is the day of Florida and Florida State, uh, but Florida State uh, had a problem with you know, Jameis Winston, who's the quarterback for the Tampa Buccaneers. I think clearly raped uh, a woman on campus or in that uh, area. Um, and the local police and later on the county attorney, become a state attorney in Florida, couldn't process the case in an effective way. And I think if, that it may be that, you know, if we recognize that we are training our commanders so that they can process cases and just in a de-biased way, right, just so they can actually see the facts for what they are, that maybe our county attorneys or the functional equivalent of those uh, need to go through the same kind of training so that they are getting the training that their special victims council uh, might be getting. Um, not the not the woman uh, that did it at the Kavanaugh hearing, right, which wasn't really the training I was expecting, wasn't really what I was expecting to see. <coughs> uh, but we get some amount of that training so that they can actually process cases in, uh, in a way where the facts can be interpreted in the way that the facts ought to be interpreted. And to, I think to add to Colonel Carpenter's comment there, uh, the commander making that determination has the benefit of a broad range of legal advice. On the one hand, from the individual we've talked about previously, a staff judge advocate, who is an attorney assigned to the command uh, in the in Navy and the Marine Corps. Uh, our client is actually the Department of the Navy, and the commander knows that. And so we give advice to the representative of the client uh, in the client's best interest, whether or not to proceed. There's also a, a prosecutor and a defense counsel in the mix. But more importantly, in keeping with sort of the, the topic of the panel discussion here, uh, one of the things that the civilian sector might take away from the military experience is the role that Victims Council plays in illuminating the decision-making process of the person who decides whether this is a case or not. Right? And so uh, both by statute and regulation that apply to all the services, the commander making this decision has to hear from the victim. And they ordinarily do that through Victims Council. This is actually a great benefit to a commander. Almost all the commanders I talk to about this, and it's a lot of them, uh, they're very grateful to have victims counsel assigned to these cases because they help them sort the legal issues and tell them what the victim wants. And that's a real hard thing to do, especially when victims don't always know that themselves. I'll leave to my victim counsel uh, colleagues on the panel here to talk in greater depth than that. 
but having that voice heard where the rubber meets the road on whether this is a case or not, whether there's a prosecution or not, whether a person gets fired or not, kicked out of school or not. Uh, having that voice heard in an articulate and, and well-researched uh, way has been critical for, for our success. And I think that there was some thought that when that was required, that the Victims Council or the victim would be providing input to the convening authority, um, it would be almost a uniform type of input. Like it would always be, I want to go forward with the charges. And I, in my experience, that has not been the case. It's not infrequent for the victim to say, you know what, I, I really don't want to move forward with the court martial process, uh, but I would like X to happen. I would like this person out of the service. If there's a way to make that happen, that would be what I would be interested in. Or I really am not interested in getting this person severely punished. I really think this wasn't this big a deal. I'm really not that impacted by it, and I want this to happen. So something that, and I'll leave it to you to speak uh, I to your. Absolutely agree. In, in my experience, there's been, uh, I wouldn't say just as many, but it's not infrequent that the victim's interests don't necessarily align with the government, particularly after a lengthy uh, investigation where uh, a lot has changed in that victim's life and circumstances. Um, you know, the world doesn't just stop because there's an investigation going on um, and significant life events uh, take hold and um, prosecutors will say, well, of course she's going to show up. Why, why would she not want to um, <coughs> to this motion hearing? Um, and the answer might be as simple as, know she uh, she just lost like a, a person in her family that was a s support role for her or um, she's been in months of therapy she's actually made progress and now you're asking for her to undo all that by reliving this experience this trauma um, so there's a whole host of reasons why that may take place and why I think the military has a really strong um, mechanism to uh, reflect that will in that it's not a binary, binary choice between uh, prosecution and not prosecuting. We actually give, uh, you know, the commander has a toolbox, uh, we call it, of different adverse administrative actions that they can take. Um, and sometimes something as simple as, well, I just want to make sure that he's not in the army anymore, is going to satisfy uh, that, that victim. Um, that's enough for them to get closure and healing. Um, and fortunately, that doesn't require them to take the stand and be cross-examined uh, ad nauseum as to every detail of every decision they made uh, that day. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a lot uh, of nuances there and having an attorney who can articulate that to the command uh, is a, a certain plus to the victim. I'd back up one step just to, to have you discuss um, the reporting options that a victim has and how that might contrast to, say, a similarly situated college student uh, victim. Sure. So I'll let you handle the college student <laughs> victim portion of this because you are way more knowledgeable that, at that than me. But in uh, the Army and the other services uh, have a similar uh, mechanism. Our, our program is called the, the SHARP program, Sexual Harassment and uh, Abuse or Assault Response um, prevention program, um, and the DOD calls it SAPR. Um, but what it amounts to is that the victim of a sexual offense has the ability to make what's called a restricted report or an unrestricted report. A restricted report can only be received by certain individuals um, who would have a confidential relationship with that uh, victim. Um, we call them sexual assault response coordinators. Um, we have uh, chaplains, um, and we also have uh, psychotherapists, um, all of which can receive a restricted report, uh, meaning it's not going to go anywhere uh, and start an investigation just because that report has been made. Um, that's so the person can get treatment for the offense of which they've been a victim, um, go get medical help. Um, go get mental health um, and not have to worry about whether or not this has triggered off uh, an investigation that they'll, they'll soon lose all control over. Um, the other side of the coin is the unrestricted report, which is 
uh, exactly what it sounds like. It will, uh, if a command becomes aware of a sexual assault, um, or if law enforcement or if other individuals who are not those uh, special confidential um, intakers uh, become aware, then that's going to trigger that investigation. Um, and, and the benefit of a restricted report, unrestricted report uh, apparatus is that uh, the victim can choose to change her mind if she does a restricted report. Um, so they haven't you know, completely foregone the ability for there to be an investigation. Um, they've just delayed that decision making until whenever, if ever, they're ready to, to go through that process. I'm not sure if the civilian world has an equivalent. Sure. That. Are there any um, college attorneys here? No? Okay. So um, when I worked for the Office for Civil Rights and we dealt with Title IX, Title IX just really sets up goalposts and it doesn't dictate to colleges how to implement Title IX necessarily. It just talks about what they want the end result to be. So I can't speak to every single college when I speak when I say this, but in my experience, um, most colleges didn't have any kind of restricted reporting or restricted reporting type of option, meaning that there wasn't a way for a sexual assault victim to go to someone um, and keep it confidential in the sense that there weren't named entities other than counselors, which obviously wouldn't have necessarily a requirement um, unless there was a state requirement to report sexual assault. Um, but they could always go to um, their friends, they could always tell friends about it. In other words, there wasn't necessarily anything that triggered an investigation unless they went to the police. There were some colleges that had this dual role for resident assistance. There might be some requirements for resident assistance that would be the people who are there in the dorm rooms that if they learned about a sexual assault, they had an obligation to go forward to the Title IX coordinator and report it. But they're really, it just was a sort of a, a different piece. So it's hard to compare an unrestricted and restricted reporting option in the military with college Title IX requirements. I think one of the reasons for that makes sense if you think about being <coughs> required to say what, right? And so in the civilian uh, world, uh, the government doesn't necessarily have authority to tell all of you that you must tell me if someone else told you you were sexually assaulted. In the military <coughs> world, you've got authority over everybody and gobs of it, right? And so uh, there were standing orders, and there is one, for example, in the Department of the Navy that says if I become aware that Lieutenant Commander Luce has committed an offense, uh, unless, doing, unless reporting that offense would incriminate me, I have an obligation to report it. Everybody. All the time. And so our restricted reporting option was largely an outgrowth of sort of carving out these groups of folks that wouldn't have that obligation so that we could remove <coughs> a barrier to care. And the removal of that barrier to care necessarily meant cloaking these disclosures and confidentiality so that they could go and talk to a doctor, so that they could go to the hospital, so that they could talk to a therapist, uh, so that they could seek treatment and do that in a way that wouldn't trigger all of these other legal consequences that they might not be prepared to deal with right now. Um, so, you know, it, I think it makes a lot of sense when you think of it in that way and <coughs> it compares maybe better to those other mandatory reporters in the civilian sector because the government does have regulatory authority over doctors and nurses and all these other people who then must report if they learn certain things certain ways. And when you think about it, uh, sir, there's a lot of, um, let's face it, there's a lot of things in the Uniform Code of Military Justice that aren't crimes in the civilian world. We have our own unique set of rules that uh, we're held to as uh, members of the military um, that frequently uh, will turn up as uh, what we'll call collateral misconduct uh, in a sexual assault scenario. Um, so I'm sure you can imagine when someone's in the shock of trying to uh, grapple with uh, the sexual assault that they've um, been victimized by, um, is there uh, a concern that perhaps there was underage drinking? Is there a concern that there was fraternization? Um, is there a concern means, that there's... Which means... Fraternization is um, a, a relationship of undue familiarity between um, a soldier or an officer of a different rank. Um, we have certain groups of individuals who um, can't uh, interact uh, as military equals. Um, and so, uh, you know. Kind of like a professor dating their students. Yeah. <laughs> the, the classic <laughs> example is a rank disparity, right? So, a lieutenant colonel 
I would not, I've, I've been happily married for a great many years now, but <laughs> I, would, I would not be permitted to go out on a, a date, a romantic date with a captain. It's a two-year felony. <laughs> Let that sink in for a second. <laughs> and so that's going to be a, uh, an important uh, decision that that victim is going to have to make at a time when she's probably, or he even, um, isn't in the best state of mind. Um, so if we have this restricted reporting option, give them a chance to breathe, to get access to an attorney to advise them on what the options are and the likely outcomes of making this information known to the government and investigator, um, that often yields much better results than um, the you know, immediate four alarm fire approach that everyone is involved, everyone is investigating, um, and all the details are going to be known uh, sooner rather than later. Quickly uh, switching to the prosecution side, what kind of training do new prosecutors get uh, in uh, when, they, when they start out as uh, new prosecutors and, and what kind of supervision are they given at trial? I can speak a little bit to the Navy side and I think we do things maybe a little different than some of the other services. So we have what we call a first tour judge advocate program. So I'll speak a little bit about that and then the training on top of it. So you come out of law school and for two years you do six months in our four core practice areas which would be as a trial counsel, defense counsel, legal assistance, which is like your family law and wills and things like that, and then um, staff judge advocate, like uh, what uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kazin was talking about, <coughs> advising a commander. So you do six months learning those areas first. <coughs> when you're in the trial counsel side or a new prosecutor, you're shadowing more experienced prosecutors. They're not just like throwing you out there to, uh, at the very beginning with the most complex case um, at the very beginning. Um, like my first tour, although I was a defense counsel, one of my very, very first cases, uh, my boss handed me, uh, my client was charged with forcible rape. And back then, I think the death penalty was still on the table for that. I was literally right out of law school. I was looking at that going, holy smokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that there was some evaluation on that that uh, that wasn't the best way for us to train our judge advocates, and it wasn't the best way to ensure that everybody, that it was a fair and just process for all, all parties involved. So we kind of revamped the program to make sure that everybody was getting training, um, and so they're not thrown in there. He, we, he was acquitted, so um, it all worked out for him. <laughs> I, mean, I won. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, it was... Uh, um, not the way that we, I think, we wanted to do business. As far as uh, trial counsel, so one of the things that we, I don't know what the name of it is now, they call it, is it SVC now, the Special Victim Counsel Qualified, is that what we're, we call it, or the Navy uh, calls it as well? Marine Corps is uh, Victims Legal Counsel Qualified. Okay, There's so a separate appointment they, they've changed, I guess they've changed it over the years. I, I took a class that was called uh, the Forensic Experiential Trauma Interview course that I had to take for two weeks, I think, at Fort Leonard Wood. Good job, Army SVC. guys. It's really nice. It's really pretty there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, is it SVCC or something mm -hmm. like that? So that is one of the courses. And before a trial counsel can actually prosecute a sexual assault case, you have to go to these kind of kinds of courses and be qualified to do that. And that was put in place, I think, several years ago. I haven't been a prosecutor in a while, so that was a long time ago. And it, it, they further developed it and refined it as to the training that needs to occur. Same on the defense counsel side as well. Um, special training that you have to have before you can <coughs> represent these sailors and Marines and I think Marines and soldiers are probably the same way as well I'm not 100% certain but we have all, all specialized training before we throw you into the deep end now and in the Coast Guard you still get thrown into the deep end <laughs> they, they only have 160 active duty checks period so they just don't have sort of the time to spend training people up you just kind of are gonna do as what happens when the tank commander loose, and you're just going to get a case. Or you're going to move. They forward. come and work with us sometimes on the they defense do, side. They do, yes, on so the defense side. That's that's probably. A, I'm sorry. That, that's probably a lesson to be drawn here too. And uh, we just completed a, a 16 year sort of uh, what we call the trend analysis study, where we looked at uh, the decreasing total volume of practice in litigated courts martial uh, since about 2002 ish. Uh, Back then, when I, when I came into the Marine Corps, same thing, thrown into the courtroom, I tried my first contested jury trial, uh, I think six weeks <coughs> after I graduated from NGS, I was brand new, someplace in Japan, they're like, try this case, okay. Uh, you know, at that time we were trying about 1,100 uh, courts martial a year in the Marine Corps. Uh, 
last year we tried 300. Mm. Right? And that's, that's indicative of a lot of things. Commanders have uh, used administrative tools more frequently for lesser offenses. Uh, and so very minor and petty offenses are often disposed of administratively. But it's also probative of the fact that uh, the complexity of practice has exploded. And I can point you at certain court cases that have precipitated that. Uh, notably, the implementation of the Sixth Amendment right of confrontation post Crawford to a great body of our cases, which <coughs> were uh, your analysis cases. And now I couldn't just lay the report on the on the bench anymore. But it's also attributable to uh, the increase in litigation of sexual assault cases, which, as you all know, are extremely complex. They <coughs> often involve multiple experts in a single proceeding, and that it, it requires a lot of experience and knowledge on the part of the counsel that are doing them. It also takes a lot more time and a lot more money. Um, and what I think we're finding, and I speak anecdotally here, is that the relative complexity of it uh, has increased along with cost and time. Uh, I would anticipate that civilian institutions would have similar experience even where that litigation is administrative in nature because the issues don't get any less complex uh, from a human perspective. There are maybe fewer legal vehicles to address them. But uh, So the, the Army and... and, and Professor Carpenter and, and actually Colonel Cook, uh, Colonel Cook in the back there can attest to the, the changes over the last 17 years, at least from my career point of view, of how the Army did with this. And, and part of it is also a reflection of being an Army at war for 17 years and limited number of resources with an expanding portfolio of things they wanted their JAGs to do. And so the, the career path for a captain in the coming into the Army in 2002, 2001, was you were going to do a year of legal assistance, you were going to do a year of claims, you were going to do a year of administrative law, something just to kind of get your, your feet wet because you've probably never practiced law before. And then almost from there, typically you would go to be a trial counsel, a prosecutor for two years. It was pretty rare that you'd ever see a first term judge, army judge advocate as a defense counsel. It happened, but it was not the projected career path. Usually after two years of being a prosecutor then, you'd be a defense counsel. So when I walked into the courtrooms, almost always the most experienced <coughs> trial practitioners in the courtroom were the defense counsel. That shifted quite a bit when, when we started ramping up and sending out attorneys um, and suddenly operational law became a much more important part of our practice and the number of courts marshals went down and the interest in military justice went down. And then of course we hit that point where Congress said, you guys know what you're doing. You know, you've got a, you now suddenly you <coughs> have a first term a person who's been out of law school for three weeks trying a murder case as a defense counsel, that's a problem. And so the Army has really refocused on the training aspect of getting more experience in. And so they called it different things. It was called the CLAC, the Criminal Law Advocacy Course, when I was a captain. Um, and it was semi-optional, in which case if your boss didn't want you to go, you didn't go. Um, and so like, I never went to any training thing before I started trying all my cases. They just threw me in there. Um, now, I had the benefit of being a South Sen and getting to do DUI cases and traffic cases, which is a great way to learn. If, if you want to learn how to just kind of get in the courtroom and get your feet wet and you know, go do some bunch of traffic cases, you'll, you'll learn how to lay a foundation for, for a, a Toxalizer 5000. But most judge advocates were not getting the opportunity, so the CLAC became the Intermediate Trial Advocacy course. And they called it Intermediate because everyone at the basic course gets some basic crim law um, procedures and stuff like that and once you left the JAG school you were certified <coughs> to be a trial counsel um, by the Judge Advocate General um, but then in the defense and then now we've kind of in, increased um, with money available uh, they have the intermediate trial advocacy course they have the sexual assault trial advocacy course which is a great course uh, it's held offsite it's got prosecutors in defense and it's a true advocacy course um, and, they're, and they're continuing to push uh, more and more of the training because they realize with with less cases and more complex and less opportunity to try cases that are lower threat um, that they need to ramp up the training. And so I think that we've done that quite a bit over the years. And, uh, when I met Brian the first time, it was at the SATAC back in uh, Utah. I'm oh, not sorry, we were at Waco. Waco in Waco. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think you can attest just what a great course that was of two weeks of intensive advocacy and, and procedure um, uh, that, that they got. And I find that most of the attorneys that come out of that course are much better for it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I just wanted to make the comment, too. I know that the title of this panel is What Civilians Can Learn from the Military Experience in <coughs> Sexual Assault and Harassment, but um, I would hate to have anyone walk away thinking that uh, the military doesn't 
pay attention just as much to uh, civilians um, prosecute cases um, and, and try to take on uh, best practices uh, where we can implement them in, in our system. Um, and you know, at, at one example of that is uh, our, our TJAG, uh, General PD is now um, looking into uh, uh, draft programs, pilot programs, where um, we have prosecutors who previously um, had many, many different roles in addition to their statutory, in, in addition to their main role of being a, a prosecutor of felony level cases. Um, so it took incredibly skilled, uh, uh, broadly skilled individuals um, to uh, fulfill that role. Um, but as the cases have become more and more complex, um, I think some of the, the calculation for that trial has been to um, try to, to redefine that position to, to look a lot more like a district attorney office um, would look in terms of having uh, incredibly experienced uh, district attorneys um, surrounded by um, assistant district attorneys who uh, maybe are second chair in the case um, before they're just thrown into um, First chairing a felony level criminal case. That's that's built into the the Marine Corps regulatory structure that we issue from my office. Also, um, and we use the term sets and reps. You got to get the sets and reps in the courtroom. And at a certain point in your career as a, a, a litigator, you get to the point where you can kind of stand up with your eyes closed and, and scroll through a certain blue book that we've. I think we're up to the sixth edition now. <laughs> Just kind of rattle off the foundation for how, how do I get a photograph in? How do I get a business record in? Uh, it takes the sets and reps to do that. And so uh, internal to the Marine Corps, we have, in fact, looked to the civilian bar. I think we can talk maybe not about the deliberative stuff, but uh, certain uh, very uh, recent changes to the code that are about to be implemented will include things uh, that are very familiar to you on how to exercise prosecutorial discretion, for example. And in the Marine Corps, we looked to the uh, National District Attorneys Association guidelines. We looked to the United States Attorney's Manual. We kind of hybridized those two lists and then salted that with the things that make us unique in the military because you're making the same legal judgments that we are. We have some additional considerations. Um, same thing on the, on the ITAC and the training, the way that course is focused. I managed the Intermediate Trial Advocacy course for three years when I was teaching at the school. Um, and you get a lot of sets and reps. <coughs> it's all sets and reps all day. You will interview real experts. You'll have a forensic toxicologist from the University of Virginia who produced the report that you're reading on the stand with that person sworn as a witness. Uh, excellent experience in digital forensics. Um, those are all lessons, frankly, that I think we learned from you and tried to fold that into to what we're doing across the DOD. In addition to making sure our prosecutors are prepared, um, what are the uh, additional rights and protections for the accused in the military justice system? Uh -huh. you, we've, you've been waiting for this, it's all you. Oh, no. <laughs> I think I'm the, the defense-friendly person up here. Um, I think there, there's a, a number of different things we do. One of the things that stands out to me is, at least that we always talk about, what is our, the discovery rights that are afforded to the defense. It's different than the federal system. We have a, we, I don't know if there's, I think it's just, we have a more open book discovery, kind of more like, government give us everything, and they give you everything in the, in the defense world or in our, in our world. Um, so we get more than what you might see out in the civilian practice. Um, one of the things too, I think, and I could be wrong on this one, but maybe we have easier access to uh, free defense attorney and defense counsel advice. So um, we have our defense <coughs> offices are open, you know, five, you know, like five days a week for people to literally just walk in and they can find a defense attorney there all the time. And it doesn't matter how much you make. I, I have had flag officers come in and want to talk to a free defense attorney make a lot of money you could go hire somebody but they want the free attorney I guess like well. officers and admiral oh sorry admiral general um, <laughs> so you, we you get the whole gamut so we have that um, we have access to expert witnesses that you can have at like access at our hospitals and things like that that we can get uh, one thing that's a little different with our our system is that we have to ask the government to pay for an expert if we want somebody out in town so if we want to a specialized forensic psychologist or psychiatrist, um, defense counsel will have to submit a request that goes through the prosecutor. The prosecutor typically, if they're 
on any of my cases. It seems like they would always deny it, and then you have to end <laughs> up in court. Um, and the convenience authority is the one that's paying for it. So that's always it's kind of a unique system that we have that is, uh, I think that's maybe less of a right for an accused, which makes it a little bit more challenging to a certain extent. Uh, one of the things we do have that's new to the Navy is our defense litigation support specialist, which is our defense investigators. Um, that's assigned to each of our defense offices in the Navy that um, have a whole host of experiences based on however that office wanted to, what they wanted to hire. And that person will be assigned to a case just like a defense attorney would be assigned to a case and will go out and do the investigation for you. Um, so it actually lightens the load for the defense counsel a little bit so you don't have to go out and interview all the witnesses and redo the investigation, which typically we would have done in these a lot very complex cases. Now we have somebody with experience that can go and do it for us, which is very nice. And it's a free service to the accused as well, so which is nice. Do you have a question? I do have a, I was going to ask you. You're doing a great job. And I was asking, could you address one thing that I think one of the big differences in the past, is, and it's changing a little bit, and it, most civilians can't believe there's no standing court. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we're, we're used to going down federal, as soon as the case is filed, it's given to a judge, everybody knows who's got it, everybody knows where you make your motions, and now you have some new provisions for magistrates. Um, I wonder if you could just explain this when I say no standing court. I mean, I'm not sure everybody knows what I mean, but so it, it I think that the idea was to be able to have judicial officers who are who can be access, who can be accessed earlier on, and so some things that were used to be very difficult before are maybe a little less difficult. So there's there's really two aspects to it. One is is yes, so there is no standing courts um, for a case. The court is convened by the general by the commanding general. So the court comes into existence through a process called referral, and that's when the judge finally gets some power. And so it used to be historically true that a judge, a military judge, had no power beyond the court martial that he was con that was convened. So two things have changed that will go into effect come 1 January 2019. One is authorities. They've given tr a judges sort of standing authorities. If you're a military judge, if you're certified and sworn as a military judge, and you're serving in a military judge billet, you now have the authorities to do pre-case subpoenas, pre-case um, uh, search authorizations or warrants for certain electronic evidence, things of that nature, things that, that trust, you know, we're used to district court judges doing just normally because they have standing courts. So those powers now exist, those pre invest so that allows a little better information gained through the investigatory process. Uh, we used to have to rely on either the good graces of Google um, or whatever company we were asking for, or um, we'd have to try to convince some uh, U.S. attorney to help us get a subpoena or help us get a search authorization through the civil courts. So now we'll have those authorities that exist. The second part of that is these new things, you know, magistrates. Magistrates in the military used to be just some lawyer who would be able to do search authorizations and pretrial confinement reviews and things like that. Um, the services are all going to do things a little bit different. So these magistrates now, they, they want to have, for lack of a better term, baby judges. Um, similar to what you think of as a federal magistrate judge who can do misdemeanor level cases. Uh, I think some of the services are going to implement that magistrate program right away. They're going to have magistrates, certain types of courts martial, but also be available to do all of the stuff that we don't necessarily can't find a judge for. Hey, I need a search warrant. I need to subpoena Google. I need to do these things. I need a judge to do it um, or someone with that magistrate authority. The Army is going to take a slower approach to this. Um, the Army is going to still have the magistrates doing some of the search authorizations, but we're not going to let the magistrates hear cases just yet. Um, we just kind of want to, we don't necessarily have the, the bench on the bench, enough uh, field grade or experienced military justice practitioners to, to fit that, that role. Um, but I think that the ability of now judges, before a case gets to the court, to actually issue some subpoenas and get information so that everyone can make an intelligent decision about what's going on is going to be something that across the services we're going to use. I don't know if everyone else is also going to do something similar with the magistrates. We're not going to have magistrates yeah. in the Navy at all, <laughs> at least for now. I mean, we have similar concepts, but we will have judges doing the things that we're talking about here. So um, they'll, they'll assume that role, and we're just going to wait and see kind of how much it's used before we actually, because we're in the same boat where we, we don't have the, the resources 
to do it yet. So we're kind of feeling it out to see what is the demand, what is the need. And then, but we're, the resources will be there for, for the purposes for the council to go and get these things. Marine, Marine Corps is assessing the same thing. Uh, I don't think that the staff judge advocate to the commandant has determined yet whether or not we'll employ magistrates. The one thing I might uh, revisit is based on the new statutory authority of military judges to issue these warrants that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kasman was talking about. Uh, this is why it matters to you. Uh, if you have an institutional client that is the custodian of records that are subject to a warrant under the Stored Communications Act, welcome to military justice practice uh, because you may receive one of these warrants signed by a military judge uh, and it has the same force and effect as a, a warrant uh, signed by an article three court judge uh, and so i anticipate that to be the source of a really interesting series of developments with respect to how we litigate for example motions to quash and things like that uh, because we'll have whole new rafts of counsel who are uh, unfamiliar with military justice practice, but you have a legal obligation to your clients to appear and be heard on these matters. And I, I literally, I cannot wait for that to happen. I'm really looking forward to it. And that's a very exciting time to be practicing in this area. And it's, it's an issue that, I mean, there are federal attorneys out there, in the, even the U.S. Marshal's Office, that didn't know what to do with some yeah. of our stuff. So for the last 50 years, we've had a thing called a warrant of attachment. If a civilian witness refuses to show up at a court martial, just like a civilian judge, the military judge can issue a, a warrant for that person to be brought before the court martial. When I sent one to the United, a, a witness that decided they just weren't going to show up for their, with their subpoena, uh, we sent the warrant of attachment to the marshal's office, and the marshal's like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And so I had to go through the marshal's, and then I had to go through the marshal and the U.S. Attorney's Office and the U.S. Marshal's legal advisor to explain to them what a warrant of attachment was and go through the statute and say, the statute specifically says the U.S. Marshal shall serve and shall bring the person before. I said, hey, we'll pay for it. You know, we're going to pay for your travel, but you need to get that person, you need to get them on a plane, you need to get them to my court martial. So it's, if, if the federal government can't talk to itself, we, we're trying to imagine what it's going to be like when the first time uh, Google or Facebook or someone gets one of these military subpoenas. Um, we're doing some things. We're trying to make them. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to make them look a lot like the ones that you get from yeah. a U.S. district court. You know, the same fonts. <laughs> <laughs> we thought about this stuff. We had we sat and debated this um, in the joint service meeting. What font are we going to use, and what's going to be the title block on it, so that it looks just like what they get from a federal district court, um, so that you know there's comfort in fonting, I guess. So. Is there a question? Uh, yes, thank you, Captain Williams. Uh, just a question for the array. This is a hypothetical question, okay? So hypothetically, if you were uh, uh, supervising a 10-year uh, JAG officer who is now back at law school doing an LLM, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, and uh, he just wants to it wasn't uh, hypothetically <laughs> create a class on uh, elements of trial practice uh, mil in military justice for, you know, a law school. Uh, what are the elements that you would like to see in, 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 uh, uh, covered in that type of a class? Uh, the sort of essential elements that would highlight for, these are students who are not uh, military uh, uh, officers at all, uh, covered so that, so, that, so that students, law students, uh, could understand the major differences as they apply, specifically in the context of trial practice, but not limited to that. I would say hypothetically, I have a syllabus <laughs> <laughs> that I can provide. Uh, yeah, so it turns out I teach a military justice class. I don't teach it in terms of like I, would, like I did at the law school, which was fully integrated with trial advocacy, where at, at the Army's law school, it was you go into a room, you get a little bit of a lecture, and then you get out and practice uh, stuff. Um, but I cover, you know, here are certain offenses that are slightly different. Here's how they work. Most of the offenses are the same. Most of the code is a, it's a federal common law looking code uh, with just, uh, before they renumbered them all, they were all kind of packaged up, all the military ones were all packaged up. Uh, and the procedure itself is not that uh, different either. So it's really only learning a few basics along the way. Uh, but hypothetically, I'd be happy to share this hypothetical syllabus. <laughs> so, so when I, when I look, my biggest concern with, with the trial practitioners in the military is not necessarily the procedural stuff. Here's the, the secret. It's not alien. The court martial process is not alien. It might have been 70, 80 years ago or 250 years ago when there was one attorney in the room who was the advisor to the panel, advi to the jury, advisor to the government, and advisor to the accused. I mean, we've come quite a long way from that. The, the changes to the military justice system make it look a lot more like a civilian courtroom. 
or I often become concerned with my, the younger trial practitioners that have worked for me is what I call the mechanics of being a trial attorney. Um, they can read a book and they have so much knowledge in their head, but how to organize and move a case forward, how to prep a, a witness folder and a witness file, um, all that stuff is, is areas I think we've lost in focusing a lot on advocacy and not enough on um, what I say call trial mechanics, the ability to lay a foundation. Um, sometimes I get, as again, I was our regional defense counsel, I had 20 attorneys working for me, and I would just sit in the back of the courtroom losing my mind um, because they didn't have their Salzburg in front of them. On, um, at, you know, you definitely need to have some of the unique procedural processes, particularly pre-trial and post-trial, but what you can never forget is that, is that being a trial attorney um, is a very unique skill set um, that, and particularly with organization, I see is where our guys lack. And so I always kind of always focused on, hey, what are the mechanics? How are you going to do this? How are you going to organize this? And then talk to me about theme and theory later. I want to know how you're going to how you're going to actually work this case forward. Make them build a proof matrix. <laughs> if you can't show me a proof matrix that shows what evidence you'll offer on every element of the offense, and then show me your theory of admissibility for every <coughs> one of those pieces of evidence, you're not ready. That was a standard trial. A lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> but our trial lab program was built by taking stuff from the civilian world, a lot of ABA mm -hmm. journal stuff. Yeah. I'm trying to think of that author's name. McElhaney. Yeah, McElhaney. <laughs> All his stuff. Um, it was taking stuff from the civilian world, and the trial part itself is the same. One thing I was going to mention earlier about just the standing courts, it turns out that one of the most difficult things for prosecutors, which is something that you can't really teach, is because we don't have standing courts, the prosecutor is essentially in charge of making a courtroom occur whenever there's a trial, right? There's not a staff, there's not a professional judiciary uh, core that's running our, our courts. So we have lots of trial, lots of just kind of dopey errors that are built into cases just because of the inexperience of having to pull things. I mean, you got prosecutors running around filling up water pitchers <coughs> and stuff like that. You haven't, lived until you've been, yeah, you haven't lived until you've been yelled at in open court for not having coffee for the panel members. Or the air conditioner not working. Or the air conditioner not working. Yeah, and then yeah. Stuff, yeah. Yeah, so all that <laughs> stuff that should be pushed over to somebody else. And I, I think, and we just brought it up quickly, uh, it, what happened in the Military Justice Act when we started, when we broadened the judge's powers beyond any real source, right, beyond any power from the commuting authority, that was the first crack in breaking down this just an antiquity, right? The fact that we convene a court presto out of nothing and then adjourn it at the end and it, poof, it disappears. I think that's going away in like probably the next 20 years. Like where we'll actually, have, like even dopey things like the font on the top of an order, you can't put in the first judicial circuit of the United, there is no, first, first judicial circuit is a administrative, how do I rate my judges? There is no such thing as the first judicial circuit in the U.S. Army. It's, United States versus accused. That's it. Uh, and so I think at some point it's going to be getting rid of our post-trial process, which now has pretty much gotten rid of, uh, other than leaving enough behind to make a headache. Mm -hmm. Just getting rid of the post-trial process, getting all that over to a professional judiciary class, or uh, not a class, but a uh, branch, uh, and they pick all those duties up. And then for the trial counsel, it really is, you know, you show up, you try your case, <coughs> You try it the way McElhaney, and uh, I'm trying to think of the old Chicago public defender. McCarthy? McCur yeah, uh, Ter 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 Terrence McCarthy. Yeah. <coughs> Just doing it the way those guys do it, uh, and it looks pretty much the same. Ma'am, do you have a question? Thank you all for being here. You did a great job for a complicated area for those that don't live in that world. Um, I'm curious, I know you mentioned earlier, Professor Carpenter, that you are studying to see if any of this works. Within the military, there have been a lot of changes since the sexual assault types of surveys have changed. You've changed the processes. You've changed some of the charges. What is working and what is not? And I'm curious more in terms of even with giving special victims counsel extra standing within a courtroom, the accused has got constitutional rights. The government's got its interest. The victim does have some statutory rights, but they don't trump the others. Are they adding to more litigation out there? What, what do we know is defined? I'm waiting for a Brady, a Brady challenge where a victim gives information to somebody in the government because you're paid by the government. Defense can't get it because it's confidential. I mean, so what is working and what's not? And what preliminary thoughts do you have if you're studying to say, OK, is any of it working? So let's say hypothetically that I've got a FOIA request that's inside an Excel spreadsheet on this hypothetical computer. Uh, so what I'm measuring right now is whether the change in 2007 from a 
common law statute to what essentially is a Michigan model statute and offender centric statute has had any uh, effect. And I can measure at the law enforcement level, I can also measure at uh, the commander level, right? So what decisions did law enforcement make uh, on a case? What decisions did uh, the community authority make on a case? And see if that 2007 change uh, had any impact. My hypothesis is gonna be that it doesn't, right? And that's because um, there are still normative places in the law where all the either rape myths or beliefs about how victims should behave, men should behave, how men and women should behave in sexual situations can still flow through the law. So I think it's gonna turn out that uh, changing substantive law doesn't matter that much. Changing norms does matter. And, uh, and I can also take a, just to see how have things changed overall over, I've got it from 2004 on to, to now. To seeing if there are some changes, I think the any causal factor behind those changes is gonna be much more about uh, the normative work that's being done in terms of uh, what does a sexual assault actually look like, uh, the things that you all have learned as special victim uh, counsel that have, have now gotten out into the field. Uh, and I can look for that uh, trend analysis. One thing I have done is I have measured, uh, I wanted to see if convening authorities were biased in particular cases. So I uh, picked up uh, a few years worth of data, looked at, do they send it to a court martial? Do they send it to NJP? Do they go administrative? or take no action, and it turned out that uh, community authorities, and I compared that with other serious uh, violence, crimes of violence against a person, and it turned out I could, there wasn't any bias at that point, so commanders were treating these cases about the same or sometimes more seriously than murders, robberies, uh, and other uh, assaults. Now it could turn out that that's because bias acted at the law enforcement stage uh, and I have been through that data, and there is bias at the, at the law enforcement stage, so we still have a problem with, uh, and this is still good news for those who want to keep the commanders in the system. I'm shifting blame from commanders to law enforcement. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but law enforcement, military law enforcement, unfounds uh, and finds insufficient evidence in sexual assault cases at a much higher rate. You look at the average, like, ooh, that's not good. Uh, I still have to publish that uh, finding. But there is a lot of work to be done, and part of it is just that uh, there are so many changes that we don't have any kind of a pause to see uh, if something is working. A lot of the changes, you don't need to wait for a pause, right? So everything that the people at this table are doing is super valuable, right? You don't have to wait to see if helping victims has an impact on things, because it's just the right thing to do. Uh, but I think in terms of uh, messing around the law, and what we're left with now really is are the commanders going to stay in the system or not? Uh, that we should have just kind of a pause to see if other things are working before we still start saying, well, we need to take commanders out because it's still broken. And I think it's not broken. That's, that's another lesson that, uh, you know, you get into the topic of the panel discussion here is what the civilian sector might learn from the military experience in this realm. Uh, you might get some help from Congress. Yeah. And uh, yeah. initially that may seem unwelcome to you, uh, but I'll use just a couple of examples that are procedural uh, undertakings. Uh, I'm not sure how often Congress reaches into the federal rules of evidence, but a few years ago, Congress passed a law as part of an NDAA that changed Military Rule of Evidence 513. It changed the standard uh, of confidentiality for psychotherapist patient privilege and changed the procedural rules by which uh, an accused might seek to obtain those records to the extent, uh, ma'am, as you pointed out, they might be relevant uh, because they contain Brady material. Uh, spoiler alert, you're not getting it. Um, they're in the process of examining whether or not uh, the rules with respect to character under 404A, MRE 404A, and our rules mirror the federal rules of evidence and numbering. Uh, and so there have been some very, very specific changes to what seem like just minutia in the rules. Uh, I think those procedural changes are having a significant effect on, on the, the pace of the litigation and its character, too. Uh, and that may continue. I'll be, I'll be interested to see. Uh, Colonel Carpenter's work uh, and, and where he's going with that. Uh, it's, like I said, it's an exciting time to be doing this.